Okay. So thanks everybody for joining. Very happy to uh, be here. Um, you know, I, I, I love the, the attendance. Uh, I think it's amazing how, how much of a, a, a broad sort of span this conference has. Really uh, excited to be part of it, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll definitely be back for the uh, for the in-person show that that Richard mentioned. Um, we're going to talk today about develop, developer productivity engineering. Uh, this is a relatively uh, new sort of emerging uh, practice and set of technologies uh, that's helping to remove uh, toil and friction and frustration from the process of uh, uh, of creating software it, it is pretty new even you know the silicon valley big uh, darling companies like like netflix and linkedin uh, have only started to focus on this within the last five years netflix built a productivity team back in 2017 uh, linkedin followed uh, shortly thereafter in 2018 and then a lot of other companies have, have done the same but this is it's pretty new so uh you know don't look at this as like oh it's too late for me i've missed the boat you 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 can really uh, start putting these practices in place uh, and be a hero for your organization. Uh, I'm Justin Riach. I'm the Chief Evangelist and Field CTO for Gradle. Uh, my background is primarily in software development. I spent um, a good 15 years of my career uh, writing code and moved uh, into systems integration and architecture, uh, always a, with a, a strong focus on, on open source. And so coming to Gradle and, and being able to talk about uh, developer productivity um you know was was a very natural sort of sort of move for me um but uh but yeah i you know i i am deeply aware of the developer experience and, and the pains that 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 we go through and uh hopefully we'll talk a little bit today about uh some techniques that can uh, make that better for all of us so when i talk about developer productivity engineering i like to start here right um these kids they look they look pretty happy right uh they uh are probably uh, running maybe a system out dot printlin hello world right and they're learning how to code right and it feels great right I mean that's that's why we do what we do right being able to uh, engage uh, with our creative flow and be able to solve problems with code it's it's a pretty ecstatic uh, feeling right and you know it's not just um, not just anecdotal right I mean the the brain has actually been mapped and scanned while people are writing code and it's this wonderful soup of, of both left brain and right brained activity right there's creative problem solving on the one hand uh, we're visualizing the problem we're figuring out how we could solve it with code but then there's a scientific aspect to it as well right we, we write the code and we make sort of a hypothesis with the build tool chain we say did the code that i just wrote solve the problem right uh, and i need that feedback from the compiler i need that feedback from the tool chain to tell me if what i did was the right thing so i want you to imagine for a second you know these kids are getting instant feedback right hello world pops up on the screen and 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 we're happy we're excited but what if it took 45 seconds or a minute or 10 minutes or an hour or some of the extreme cases that i've seen before like 20 hours to get that feedback from the tool chain, right? We're not going to look like this, right? We're going to look like this, right? We're, we're going to be frustrated. We're going to be unhappy. Uh, we're not going to be in that wonderful state of creative flow that's so ecstatic. Uh, we might go look for another hobby or, uh, or or figure out something else to do. And this isn't about Hello World programs anymore, right? It's 2022. Uh, IDC uh, predicted back in uh, October of 2020 that 65% of the global GDP would be digitalized by, by now. And they were right. Their prediction came true. I, let that sink in for a minute, right? That's, that's over, uh, now that's over two thirds of the global GDP is, is software driven, right? So we have to think about this. Um, the, the feedback cycles that developers go through uh and uh the work that they're doing is now responsible for roughly two-thirds of the entire global gdp all right this is serious serious business and you know software is is leading the way in innovation it it, it has for for decades at this point some of you may be aware that back in uh, june uh of of uh, this year uh the remaining eight percent of the human genome was fully mapped um, and that's a result of uh, obviously collaboration across a lot of different functions, um, but it was done over Slack, 
And it was made possible in, in some part because of advancements in deep neural networks, right? So software is helping us solve some of the greatest challenges. And the best code is written by happy developers, right? And so we should really strive to foster as much as possible uh, developer joy. Uh, I think there's no question that software innovations are now augmenting global innovation and, and helping us solve some of the biggest challenges uh, that, have, that have faced our, our society. But instead, something else has happened, right? Enterprise software development is creating, I think, a unique set of frustrations for developers. There's sort of an irony to the fact that as software projects become more successful, as more developers join on to these uh, projects, and uh, as more lines of code are written and more dependencies are needed for the software, uh, feedback cycles get longer and longer. Test cycles get longer and longer. Um, developers end up dealing with more failures in the build and more toil in general. Um, you know, I, uh, I mentioned Netflix. Um, we had the opportunity to interview one of the productivity engineers from Netflix, a guy named Danny Thomas, and we have a blog about it. I'll, I think I actually linked to it later in this presentation. Uh, and in that interview, um, you know, we, we had a lot of really interesting points about how Netflix thinks about developer productivity and what they put in place to keep developers happy and productive. But he said something that really stuck with me. He said, it is staggering the amount of friction and toil and frustration that engineers are willing to put up with. And he's, he's right. He's spot on. You know, we, we kind of think of this as, as software practitioners, as occupational hazards of the job, right? Oh, this is just what it means to be a developer. Sometimes you have to wait a long time for a build to complete. Sometimes you have to wait a long time for a test cycle to complete. Sometimes that build is going to fail and that time is going to be wasted. And then you're going to have to spend, you know, whatever the rest of the day investigating that failure. Um, but we know the common wisdom that it's no longer the big beating the small, but the fast beating the slow, right? Uh, you've probably seen this quote, uh, if, if you, especially if you've worked in the DevOps arena for any amount of time. Um, this is kind of the rallying cry for, for DevOps. And it's it's very true, right? It's, it's no longer the big companies that are, uh, you know, winning the hearts and minds of, of consumers and of people, but it's the fast and disruptive companies, right? It's the companies that can get their products out to market quickly uh, and can meet the needs of, of their consumers and deal with feature requests and all these things uh, as fast as possible. But despite that knowledge, this is still like the average developer's calendar, right? We're, we're up, we're ready, we're at 8.30, we're going, we're writing code, we're doing what we love to do, and then we're waiting. We're waiting for the local build to complete and the build fails. So now we're spending the rest of the morning, you know, debugging some failure. Uh, and then we go to lunch, right? Come back a little bit refreshed. We're back. We're coding again. We're in our state of creative flow, right? We're, we're, we're doing what we want to do. We're waiting for our local build to complete again. And this time it succeeds. Great. We push it to CI and tests are flaky. And now we're going to spend the rest of the day figuring out why the tests that were uh, succeeding in our local environment or failing in our CI environment, right? And, and I would just argue that, you know, we can do better than this. We can, we, can, we can make a better scenario for our developers. We can get out of this mindset. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this cartoon. I, I love it because it's so spot on, right? You got these two folks, they're sword fighting in the hallway. Hey, get back to work. Oh, code's compiling. All right. All right. <laughs> That's the number one excuse for legitimately slacking off my code's compiling, right? Let's Let's get out of this, and we know that um, <clears throat> we know that 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 uh, that it isn't just our speculation, right? We we run several studies, and um, one of the studies that we did, we surveyed uh, a, a large number of developers who have already put developer productivity engineering practices in place, and found out that you know some of the challenges that that led them to this, that led them to start putting these practices in place. Uh, uh, are, are, are ones that align with, <clears throat> as you'll see, some of the solutions that we recommend uh, for the practice of developer productivity engineering. So <clears throat> overwhelmingly, 92% of respondents just said too much time spent waiting on build and test feedback either locally or during CI was one of the major pain points that they were 
experiencing kind of before putting DPE practices in place. But it doesn't end there, right? 71% of respondents said that there was an inability to easily troubleshoot and determine the root cause of build tests and CI failures, including things like flaky tests. And then insufficient observability of analytics on build and test performance and regressions, failure trends and productivity bottlenecks, and finally managing the growth uh, of build and test cycles as the code base grows, right? This is, this is a shared pain, right? We, we, we all, I think, can empathize with some of these, um, with some of these problems. And, and I think, you know, we, we, we have these issues, but we're a little bit numb <clears throat> to them as an industry. Right. We're just again, I said it before, but we, we're just sort of accept some of these problems as an occupational hazard of, of the job. Right. Um, but then, you know, when I when I give this talk to other audiences, I sort of I, I like to ask the question when we're, when we're doing it interactively, when we're doing it in person, it's like who's who's even tracking metrics like local build times. Right. When developers are running builds locally at their workstations, are you taking the time that that that, that the build takes to complete and putting it on a dashboard somewhere where you can actually view the trends and, and you can actually say, oh, okay, this is the data behind the developer experience. And it's almost always no one, right? It's crickets, right? You ask that question and, oh, nobody's nobody's actually doing that. Um, but it's a very easy metric to gather, right? Our, our build tools are uh, are sophisticated enough that we can get this data out of it. And there's other data that we can uh, be thinking about to improve this experience for developers. So that's really the essence of developer productivity engineering. Then we take an engineering approach to productivity, right? We use acceleration and analytic technologies to improve the developer experience. And of course, this bubbles up to strategic management goals. We have a faster time to market, a reduced cost, and an improved quality. And really, you know, if you take one thing away from this, uh, if you're familiar with, for, for instance, the theory of constraints. If you've read The Goal by Eli Goldratt, or if you read The Phoenix Project, um, which is you know a direct homage to the book The Goal, it's effectively the same story except happening with a software company. <laughs> One of the key takeaways from the theory of constraints is that the only actions that are really going to help your business or help your organization are ones that both decrease cost and increase throughput at the same time. And that's very much the goal of, of developer productivity engineering. And it's not the only practice that's that's had this goal, right? I mean, again, uh, I, I like to draw on the what I call the ancient business wisdom of the 1970s and 1980s when it comes to uh, manufacturing and um, uh, practices that were put in place during that time. They're still very much alive today uh, in the form of software practices like DevOps. So we can go all the way back to just-in-time uh, manufacturing, business process re-engineering, change management, all of these practices would give way to other practices such as Agile and Lean, Six Sigma, and then ultimately DevOps, right? Um, I think, uh, um, uh, you know, DevOps is absolutely something that came out of a constraints-based way of thinking. How can we eliminate barriers to throughput? How can we reduce bottlenecks? And developer productivity engineering takes the same philosophy. It just it just puts it even further left, right? It says let's let's cover some of the bottlenecks to productivity that are right there in the developer experience, right? Um, long build times, long test cycle times, avoidable failures. Let's let's take it all the way to the developer experience and let's eliminate bottlenecks in that place. And let's use technology to do it, right? As opposed to what we sometimes refer to as um, productivity management, as opposed to leaning on developers to try to squeeze out more lines of code, you know, let's actually improve the experience, right? Let's, let's, let's improve build times. Let's improve test cycle times. Let's make tests less flaky, right? So that's really uh, at, at core uh, what DPE is trying to do. And it, it bubbles up to all layers of, of, of an organization, right? I mean, at the, at the ground level, the developer level, the practitioner level, we are improving um, you know, the condition of slow builds and feedback cycles. Uh, and we're making troubleshooting more efficient, right? We're making testing more efficient. But that bubbles up to a faster time to market, um, a, a better productivity in general for our resources, better efficiency, uh, and a higher quality of service, as we'll see too. Feedback cycle times have a cascading impact uh, to other parts of the project. And we'll, we'll look at that. And then, of course, not too hard to sell to the C-suite either, right? Because all of this will lead to 
uh, more and faster revenue, decrease costs, and ultimately uh, improve quality for the brand. So let's you know really focus on on what it is that we're fixing here, right? So you can imagine this is a developer. Uh, and they're dealing with feedback cycles, right? I mean, I, I really had to quantify developer experience. You know, what what is it? You know, it's a series of feedback cycles. I'm writing code, I'm hitting run, I'm running my tests, I'm compiling, and I'm waiting to get that feedback from the build system. You know, again, I'm waiting to see if my hypothesis was correct in the code that I've written. And sometimes things are fine. And by the way, this this applies to local environments, local workstations, remote workstations, and CI, right? So we 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 cover all of those different areas. Um, Justin, so sometimes things are, yeah. We have a question from the chat that relates to the oh, topic. wonderful. Uh, yeah. Sasha asks, but long build time uh, is not uh, long build time only a problem of mon big monolithic systems. Um, sometimes that's the case. Uh, monolithic uh, apps can can have long build times. If you've decomposed into microservices, you're right that your build times are probably going to go down significantly, but you're probably running a lot of tests still, right? And uh, even with that big set of microservices, you may have a lot, you know, a lot of that may shift over to just test feedback cycles. So we're going to be talking about improving that as well. Um, also, you know, we live in a mobile world, right? So Android apps and, and, and iOS apps and things like that um, tend to still be written in such a way that the build times are, are long, right? It's, it's pretty easy to uh, decompose like a platform as a service or software as a service application into microservices. Um, but when we're talking about, you know, apps that are running natively on an Android phone or something like that, we're still talking about long build times. But even if you've done that, you know, there, there are lots of ways, of course, to, to deal with the, the, the build uh, cycle times. But if you've done that by decomposing into microservices, I bet you you're still spending a lot of time uh, in the test phase too. So, so I think that part will be applicable. But no, very good point, uh, Sasha. Thank you. And, and, and yeah, uh, obviously, this is not the, the, the first approach to trying to improve build times. Um, but, I, but I think you'll see that uh, there are still improvements that we can make even for decomposed applications in terms of improving uh, the way that tests run. All right, so thanks, that's good observation. Um, okay, so sometimes things are fine. You know, sometimes feedback cycles are, are, are fine. Sometimes they just take too long, right? Which we've kind of discussed already. Sometimes it's just, you know, the, the build is not happening as fast as it could possibly be given all applied technologies, which is obviously uh, uh, non-optimal. Uh, sometimes things take too long to fix, all right? So the build fails and then we're, we, we don't have adequate visibility into the context of that build and understanding what's happening to have all the data that we need to fix the problem. And then the worst one, the worst one here, uh, the problem that could have been prevented altogether, the failure or flaky test uh, that could have been dealt with proactively so that developers wouldn't have to uh, wouldn't have to even encounter this problem, right? Which everything is infinitely more than zero, right? So uh, the more that we can just eliminate in terms of uh, the more problems we can just eliminate from the developer experience, the better. And then if you take these problems, you multiply them by 240 ca uh, you know, calendar working days a year and thousands of developers, this really adds up, right? This really adds up to a, a decrease in overall productivity and an increase in cost. And, and again, I, I want to stress what I what I just sort of said before. Like, we need to get ourselves out of this mentality of, oh, is the build fast enough, right? Or uh, is this enough for developers to deal with that it's not causing too much pain? We need to, I think here in 2022 with a 65% digitally transformed global GDP, we need to ask what I believe is the right question, which is, is the build and test cycle as fast as it can possibly be given all applied acceleration and observation and analytic technologies. I believe that's what we owe our developers. We need to be in that mindset. Uh, and again, not our speculation, right? In the same uh, survey that that uh, you know investigated some of the pain points that people were dealing with uh, commonly, uh, we also found out that 81% of these surveyed IT professionals who have already implemented DPE, so these are again, uh, companies like Netflix and Twitter and LinkedIn and Uber, you know, these different companies that have put these productivity uh, initiatives in place, 81% agree that developer productivity engineering's impact on the tool chain just made their job more enjoyable, right? So this practice really does foster developer joy. And, and there's never been a more important time to do that. Uh, because again, you know, developers and software 
are augmenting and lifting all boats in the harbor uh, for every industry when it comes to solving the challenges. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because uh, it can really be a quagmire. We could actually do a whole talk just on, <laughs> on, on what's going on with this slide. But I do want to call out you know, specifically, what are the areas that developer productivity engineering tries to focus on in terms of pain points that we've identified from the developer experience and solutions that we recommend to make those experiences better. So, um, you know, these pain points are sort of, uh, uh, you know, they sort of go from like a, an acute pain that's felt by the organization over to more chronic pains felt by the organization. Um, but the first one we've already I spent too much, probably a lot of time talking about already is wait time and context switching, right? Uh, developers having to code, they're in their state of uh, creative flow, and then we go and we issue a build or a test cycle, and then we're waiting. And then maybe we're context switching, right? Maybe we're switching to, to some other activity, which we know we pay a tax on. And I'll go into that in a little bit more, uh, the kind of the, uh, the neuropsychology of that in a minute. So what do we want? We want faster feedback cycles. And so we want to accelerate the performance of our builds. And so the technology that we recommend to do this, we have several that we'll, we'll talk about. We have build caching. And the next talk uh, after this one is actually specifically about the build cache. We'll, we'll go over some demos, uh, some optimization kind of tips and, and tricks for that uh, and show how we can implement that locally and as well as in CI. Um, uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of it later. So a build cache is the first one that we recommend. Um, test distribution, right? Which is a little bit different than something like CI fanout. We'll talk about that. And then a new practice based on machine learning that was actually uh, uh, born in the labs of Google and Facebook, but that now is being successfully productized by a number of, of different companies uh, called predictive test selection. Uh, and then ultimately performance continuity. So again, using analytics to make sure that you keep the builds fast, that you keep the builds highly performant. Okay, so the next one, inefficient failure troubleshooting. Right, so are we playing 20 questions with the build system every time a build fails? Right, are we looking for data from the environment? Are we uh, hunting around and, and looking through console logs and, and looking through CI build reports and things like that to try to figure out what happened with our build? Or do we have all that data available to us? And so for this, we recommend, you know, we want faster failure troubleshooting. And so we recommend our build scan. Um, when we go through the build scan, uh, you know, you, you, of course, are welcome to use ours if you happen to be doing a Maven build or a Bazel build or a Gradle build. You know, these are these are we have, you know, free build scans that are available to you as part of your, your build. And, and we'll look at that if you happen to be building on one of those build systems. If you're not using those build systems, one of those three, um, then just pay attention to the data that we're capturing in this, because it's not data that's hard to scrape. Right. And it does make it a lot easier for developers to figure out. Uh, what went wrong? Flaky tests and avoidable failures, right? Um, flaky tests cause problems in, in so many different directions beyond wasting time. Uh, they can also have a direct impact on quality and also just avoidable failures, failures that may be happening commonly in the build, but nobody's tracking it, right? Nobody's keeping track of, of, of these failures. And so it's hard to deal with them proactively. Um, so we'll look at failure analytics uh, as, a, as, as a way to deal with that problem. And then just no metrics. I mentioned this once before, but really like very few organizations are even keeping track of things like build times and test cycle times. Uh, and so just putting these metrics up on a dashboard can, can often be transformative for a business to really get a picture from data. Oh my gosh, my developers are dealing with uh, with with you know with with these long cycle times, maybe we can do something about that. That's often a, a very good first step for organizations that you know they learn about DPE. That how can we start doing this? The first step is often just gathering this data and making it in a way that's uh, putting it in a way that's visible to the organization. Um, and and you know this is also very important for regressions, right? I mean, maybe we go through a a, a real focused time where we're improving uh, cycle times for developers. And then a month later, we upgrade our endpoint security, or we upgrade to a new version of an annotation processor or something like that. And suddenly build times are impacted. Uh, well, you should be able to notice that. You should be able to see that trend and do something about it. And then this isn't so much about productivity, but it is a side effect of putting these practices in place. Everything that we're doing in terms of uh, efficiency and in terms of uh, uh, faster feedback cycles, it's directly, we, we recommend doing this at the build tool level. And so it's going to carry over to CI, right? We'll, we'll, we'll actually have a more 
proficient CI. In fact, sometimes um, people who are very heavily, you know, dependent on CI systems, they don't feel the pain necessarily uh, directly in the developer experience, but they look at the health of their CI and they say, oh my gosh, our agents are backed up all the time, you know, or we're, uh, jobs are always queuing. And then we put these practices in place and suddenly things are, are, are improved in CI as well. So even though it may not be directly related to productivity, uh, it's important to call out that a symptom of this can be improving our CI. Okay, so we talked about feedback cycles and, and listen, very fast feedback cycles are important. And I think that, you know, we kind of know this intuitively, um, but maybe we haven't always thought through just how far this, this really goes. So on the one hand, faster feedback cycles mean less idle and, and wait time for developers. We talked about that, which means less context switching, less changing what we're doing and trying to multitask. Um, you know, over the last uh, decade or so, you know, there's been a lot of uh, information uh, coming out of, of neuroscience that tells us that human beings can't really multitask that, that we convince ourselves that we can but it's sort of an illusion um uh, and and it's not something that we're really capable of doing but in the last couple of years uh even newer data has come out and said not only can we not multitask and 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 is it not really a thing that we can do it's actually bad for us right it's actually damaging to our executive functioning to try to force uh that that multitasking aspect and try to force content uh, context switching um, so, so fixing this leads to more focused developers, which has a direct impact on productivity and quality. But also something that's not always as intuitive um, is sort of the psychology of this. When we have faster feedback cycles, we build more often, right? Instead of uh, trying to cram a whole bunch of code in all at once, because we know that we have to wait a while for the test cycles to complete or whatnot, um, we instead just make smaller incremental changes because we know we're only waiting a few seconds on the build. So this is going to lead to earlier quality checks uh, and smaller change sets going in, which means fewer merge conflicts further down the line. Um, we're, we're, we're not introducing as many changes uh, and as many breakpoints into the code all at once, which leads to more efficient troubleshooting, a faster mean time to resolve, and fewer expensive downstream incidents, which also has a direct impact on quality. So just improving the feedback cycle times can create new behaviors in an organization and lead to very positive effects beyond uh, just the context switching aspect, which is, of course, very important. Uh, putting a little math behind this um, and, and to really kind of put this in perspective a little bit, Think about a team, um, and this is actually based on on real customer data. Um, you know, this was uh, over a, a week, uh, a one week period that this data was gathered. A team of eleven developers with a four minute build time uh, were able to basically uh, uh, basically achieve about eight hundred and fifty local builds a week. That's what this team was was doing, right? And again. That, that build is important because that's that's us asking for feedback, right? That's the developer saying to the build tool chain, did I do the right thing, right? Did I do the right thing? Uh, was 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 this the right way to solve the problem? Um, and so, and with a build time of four minutes, this team of 11 is able to achieve about 850 of these builds a week. But look at this, this team of six, that's just a little more than half the size of that team with a one minute build time is achieving over a thousand builds in that same period of time, in that same week, they're able to ask for feedback more often than this team of 11, right? And so the, the more often that they can ask for feedback, the more they're able to refine their work, right? And so in many ways, this team of six is actually acting more efficiently than this larger team of 11 developers. And let's take a look at what this looks like when we extrapolate it as well, right? So, um, you know, one of the takeaways here too, I think, is that you know, right now, kind of pre-DPE, if you will, a lot of development organizations would not see a one-minute build time as being in any way problematic, right? They would look at that one-minute build time and say, oh, that's great. And I mean, some organizations, some of you in the audience might be looking at that and be like, oh, gosh, I wish I had a one-minute build time. That, that, that sounds awesome. Um, but look what happens when we reduce this using developer productivity engineering uh, acceleration features down to 0.6 minutes. We just shave 40% of that build time off. We return 44 days a year to this team doing 1,000, 1,010 builds a week. 44 days of engineering value a year back to this team of six. 
All right. That's a big deal for a, for a team this small. That's almost like two vacation cycles for, uh, well, at least in the U S <laughs> two vacation cycles for, uh, 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 for, for developers for this team of six. Um, and what about a team of a hundred developers doing 12,000 local builds a week with a nine minute build time? We reduce this down to five minutes. We return 5,200 days a year back to that engineering time, uh, back to that engineering team. Okay. So this is, um, this can really have a, a big, a, a big impact, even with moderate improvements. All right. So again, I, I go back to the question that I posed earlier, which is, you know, we, we need to stop, we need to get out of this mindset of, you know, is the build fast enough? Is one, a one minute build time acceptable? The right question to ask is, is the build as fast as it can possibly be, given all acceleration and analytic technologies? So uh, I mentioned, um, you know, that there are tools behind this, right? I mean, DPE is all about using engineering principles to improve the developer experience, uh, to, to keep developers in a, in a state of, of creative flow, right? And to reduce the amount of context switching. So the first technology that we'll talk about that helps to improve the situation is a build cache. I think if you take one thing away from, from, from this part of the talk, it's that a build cache is not a dependency cache, right? We're, we're not talking about Artifactory or Sunotype Nexus. I mean, these are great products, right? There are obviously uh, a lot of good reasons to use a dependency cache, uh, everything from you know, improving bandwidth for dependency downloads all the way up to securing our software supply chain, very good reasons to use them but they are complementary to a build cache. They're not the same thing, right? Um, Gradle and the open source Gradle build tool introduced uh, build caching to the Java world back in 2017. If you haven't turned it on and you're, you're doing a Gradle build, I, I recommend that you turn it on. It's very easy to do. org.gradle.caching equals true in your properties file. Um, and you can, you can see how, how, it, how it works for you. Um, used by leading technology companies like Google and Facebook, uh, again, you know, Gradle is not the only uh, build tool that has a build cache. There's build caches built into uh, Clang and other C compilers. And you're starting to see, um, you know, for other compiled languages, uh, you know, this becoming an, an option. So, you know, really what I recommend is look into it. Whatever build system you're looking, you're, you're using, look, look into it and see if it supports a build cache. And if it does, you should turn it on. Um, and, you know, our uh, cache can support both user local and remote caching for distributed teams. Uh, which is the, the focus of my, my next talk on speeding up uh, Maven and, and Gradle and Jenkins uh, with a build cache. But we'll get into that a little bit here too, but we'll, we'll actually do some demos of this in the next, in the, uh, in the next talk. Um, but again, they are complementary to dependency caches. They're not mutually exclusive of one another. A dependency cache caches fully compiled binaries, whereas a build cache actually caches the outputs from uh, single phases of the build. So to use Maven and Gradle as examples here, um, because we, we brought a, a build cache to Maven as well as part of our Gradle Enterprise suite. And there's one being worked on in the community. It's, it's not uh, in, a, in a generally available release yet, um, but there's definitely activity on it. If you just Google uh, Maven build cache, you'll, you'll, you'll see where the, um, you know, where, the, where, where, where the progress has been on, that, on the open source offering for Maven uh, build cache. What, what it does is it takes the inputs from uh, Gradle tasks or Maven goals, really just phases of the build. Uh, and those inputs, as we'll see in a moment, are, are kind of what you'd expect for the different phases. Like if it's a compile phase of the build, the inputs are gonna be source code. If it's a test phase of the build, you know the inputs are gonna be that unit test and the parameters that are passed into that unit test. Um, and uh, the output of it, again, will depend on, on what the individual task is, um, but the output could be anything from, um, uh, a uh, uh, you know compiled classes to um, you know to to J unit uh, reports on on how the test was run. I see a few people asking if the, the slides are available. Yes, I'll, I'll work with Richard and make sure that everybody can get a copy of these slides. Happy to, very happy to share them. Um, those outputs can be anything from uh, compiled classes to test run results. Anything that's going to from that phase of the build go into the artifact. And so the way that the caching works um, is that at least in Gradle and, and Maven and you know other caching mechanisms are going to be similar, uh, is that we create a key based on a hash of the source code files, the JDK major version, class path, and any compiler arguments that may have been passed in. So what we're trying to do is find a context for this phase of the build. And we're trying to make sure that, um, that the cache is uh, 
you know, really solid. I mean, obviously we don't want to be pulling out of date stuff and putting it into the art, uh, the art, uh, the artifact that'll just create even more problems for us. Instead, we're creating a, a key based on, um, you know, these parts of the build that we expect would be, you know, fairly unique to, to running this part of the build. But this also, um, and then we, then we take the output and we store it in the cache according to that key, uh, which is very elegant, right? That, that means that we can use this in a stateless way, that we can distribute the cache remotely uh, so that, you know, follow the sun teams or, or distributed teams can actually benefit uh, from other developers who have populated the cache. Uh, and it also makes it very accurate, right? If anything changes, you know, source file, one character in that source file changes, then the hash is, is uh, that, that comes out of that is no longer going to match. You'll, you'll create a new cache entry from that. And this is also where optimization of the cache can become really important. We'll, we'll talk about some pitfalls for that in this, and then also uh, we'll, we'll go even more in depth in the next talk. Um, a lot of things are cacheable. Caching is generic. Uh, it can apply to any task or goal uh, that meets the requirements. So for a Gradle test or Maven Surefire inputs, these are these are cacheable check style inputs as well. Uh, so this is great. This not only helps us reduce our build times, but can also help us reduce our test cycle times. Um, and it's particularly effective for multi-module builds. So in the next couple of slides, um, we're going to look at just some caching behavior, like like how how would changes impact the cache. Uh, and, um, and, and we want to start, you know, just, just this sort of demo application that we're looking at, uh, has four modules. So if this was a pom.xml configuration in Maven, you'd see that we have a core module, a service module, a web app module, and an export API module. If this was Gradle, we would in, be including our core service web app and export API modules into this. So this is the, the project that we're looking at. So when we're not using a build cache, um, Maven will require a full build every time we make changes. Uh, Gradle is an incremental build system for those of you who are familiar with it. Um, so we will have like up-to-date parts of the build that would get skipped, but not when you're doing a clean build and not when you're switching between branches, okay? So there are, there are definitely areas where the incremental build system uh, no longer applies in Gradle and the cache has to be utilized to uh, to reduce the amount of work. So any change in any of these modules uh, will will impact uh, the, 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 this task, a test compile, you know, compiling our test harness and then running our test or doing a check style against the code that will have to be executed um, uh, when, when we're not using caching. Just to be clear on what's happening here, we've got our core module, an export API is dependent on our core module. Whoops. Uh, service is also dependent on our core module and web app is dependent on service. Uh, nothing is dependent on export API and nothing is dependent on web app. So this is how the dependency graph works. So let's say we change a public method in the export API module. Well, um, nothing depends on export API, but we did change a, a public method. So we'll have to recompile our test harness and we'll have to run that test. And we'll have to check style that code because the, the code changed, but then that's it. Every other part of this build could be retrieved from cache because there's nothing dependent that, um, that, that, that changed. What about making a change to a public method in the service module? Well, again, we'll have to compile our test, run our test, run check style on that code, and we'll have to compile the test harness um, from the dependent module, the web app dependent module, and run that test as well. But we didn't change any source code in web app, even though it's dependent on service. Uh, so we won't have to rerun the check style for web app. We can pull that from cache. And then all this other stuff from core and from export API can be pulled from cache. Um, what about changing an implementation detail in the service module as opposed to changing the public method, just an implementation detail of that method? Uh, we don't have to recompile the test harness. We just have to run the test. Uh, and we uh, have to check style the code. We won't have to uh, re uh, recompile the test harness for the for the dependent module, for the web app module, but we will just have to run that test. We won't have to check style it because we didn't change code in web app. And all this other stuff in export API and core can also be pulled from cache. So we're reducing a lot of work here. Um, remote build caches, uh, I mentioned before too, is a really good pattern because of the way that um, you know, because of the way that the cache key is generated, uh, the elegance, again, of kind of creating that, that unique cache key based on the inputs and then pulling stuff from output, uh, we can utilize CI to populate a remote cache. And then multiple developers can actually benefit from this. So you could imagine maybe a follow the sun team 
you've got somebody, you know, uh, working during one set of hours, they're making changes to the code, then you come in for your first build of the day, you pull down all the changes, or you pull down changes to the feature branch or whatever it is that you're working on. Normally, you're expecting that to be a pretty long build, right? The first first build of the day changes were introduced, you're going to be rebuilding everything. But if that remote cache has been populated, and the cache keys still match what you're uh, what you're sending into the build system, then you can actually benefit from the cache populations that were made uh, by the team that that came before you, which is a really good way, a really good way of getting as much benefit as possible out of a system like this. So it can speed up development for the whole team, uh, and of course this this impacts CI as well. Uh, CI can have faster build times. Okay, um, so. Uh, build scans, um, the next thing. So we, we've talked a little about feedback cycles through caching. Let's talk about how we can speed up troubleshooting. Uh, if you're using Maven, uh, Gradle, or Bazel, any of those three build systems, then this is, this is free. You, you, can, you, can, you can utilize a build scan today. Some of you have probably already run into this in a Gradle build before. Um, if you've uh, had a, a failed build, it, it'll often, you know, pop up in the screen. Hey, run this build again with dash dash scan to get more insights as to, you know, what happened during this build. Um, this is also available for Maven for free. Uh, and I'll show you in a minute where you can, where you can access that. What they do is provide a, a comprehensive and shareable summary of the entire build. It's almost like an x-ray of the whole build process. Uh, so things like the console output, any failures that may have happened, tests that were run and the results of those tests, all of those are included in the build scan and they can be shared, right? So I can drill down to something that happened in this build and I can turn around and create a link from it and send it in Slack and, and show somebody, show another developer that I may be collaborating with exactly where I want them to, to focus on the problem. Um, and, and it integrates with CI as well. So like Jenkins, for instance, is, is, uh, aware of these build scans and they, they pop up in the build reports, you know, so a lot of, uh, a lot of folks like to run these build scans on every build or at least run them on every failure so that uh, you have this sort of self-service interface for developers to be able to figure out what went wrong. So it's very easy to spot bugs and failure details, completely self-service to the developers. Uh, and you can share build details with a full context of what happened, right? It's 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 everything that took place during the build. It's infrastructure details, you know, like the host machine and the amount of memory that it had, garbage collection behavior. I mean, all of these things that might impact um, impact the build. So if you want to try these out, again, they are they are free. We have a we have a free build scan service that's available for Gradle, uh, Maven, and also for Bazel. Um, check it out at scans.gradle.com. Uh, for Gradle, it's just passing another uh, flag into the build, the dash dash scan flag. Or as you'll see on the instructions on the site, you can um, you can uh, instead of passing in a flag, you can actually uh, make a change to your build configuration that'll run these on every build or run these on failures, uh, whichever you know you prefer. And then uh, for Maven, uh, you just put an extension in. Uh, that's the Gradle Enterprise extension. It's available from Maven Central. Uh, so it's you know freely redistributable jar that if you need to put into your own uh, dependency cache, you, you, you're free to do that. Uh, and for, for Maven, it's just adding you know a little snippet of XML to your extensions.xml file. Uh, and then uh, build scans will be running when uh, when your Maven builds run. And there's the same configuration switches are available to you. Okay, um, so we've talked about faster builds through build caching. We've talked about faster troubleshooting through um, through the uh, build scan, right? And caching can help us with uh, both build and test tasks, right? So the output from a test task can also be cached, um, but we can speed this up even more. Uh, through a, a technique that we that's called test distribution. Um, so how does this one work? Uh, well, what we're basically saying is that for local builds or for CI builds, let's schedule tests to be run in parallel across multiple test agents in an elastically auto scaling way. Uh, so let's schedule a test uh, and then let's run it in a test distribution agent. Uh, for for Gradle solution, these are agents that actually run in Kubernetes and are fully compatible with like the KEDA uh, Elastic Auto Scaler. Uh, but there's, of course, other ways that you could set up this architecture. But this is the basic architecture here. Uh, I want to um, disambiguate this 
technique from some other techniques that are currently in use, like for instance, single machine parallelism. Uh, if you've worked in Gradle with parallel threads uh, in the open source Gradle build tool, you may have passed in dash dash parallel um, uh, or you know, increase the number of max workers that are, that are running tests. Um, this is great, but like anything that's happening on a single machine, there's a boundary and that is what resources are available to the machine. So we can do even better than this by, uh, by scheduling these tests to run an elastically auto scaling way. Uh, CI fanout has been another uh, technique that's, that's popular to, to, to perform sort of similar behavior where we will partition a set of tests uh, and then have them run in parallel uh, through CI. Um, but really, you know, all of these uh, different solutions like build caching, single machine parallelism and CI fan out, they have limitations, right? Build cache is great, but when the test inputs have actually changed, you do have to rerun those tests. Um, single machine parallelism is, is, is fine as well, but limited by the machine's resources. And CI fan out doesn't help you during local development. And, and really, you know, part of this is, is trying to be able to, as much as possible, have developers build locally and get these efficiencies to them in their local environments. Um, and you have to manually partition them, and you have to figure out a way to, to collect the results. Uh, so really test distribution um, is, a, is a technique that, that, that goes even further than this and that allows elastic auto scale to take place. And you, know, you see really good results. I mean, uh, as we start adding more remote agents, um, you, know, you end up really cutting the test cycle times. And if you think about this in combination with the caching aspect, so we avoid uh, running tests through caching, and then what we do have to run, we can distribute you start seeing some major gains, right? Real force multiplier. And of course, there's going to be diminishing returns at a certain point. So it's best to just figure out, you know, based on your build in particular, what are the ideal number of agents that could be running this in parallel? Um, Netflix has used caching and test distribution in combination to reduce a 62 minute test cycle time for one of their backend uh, Java apps down to under five minutes, which is incredible. I mean, it's totally changed the way that that team is able to uh, to work on this uh, bit of software. So if you're interested in, in, in seeing more about that, this QR code will take you to a blog article um, where Netflix describes the techniques that they did and, and the, uh, the uh, performance output that they got from putting this in place. Finally, machine learning is going to lead us to greater efficiencies. Uh, so predictive test selection. This is uh, really a, a, a pretty cutting edge approach. Uh, there's a white paper that's available. If you look up meta predictive test selection, um, I don't think I linked to it here. I should link to it. Uh, they have a research, uh, they have a site set up on their their, their research website, which has a, a long white paper on on how they uh, how they built and, and sort of conceived the predictive test selection and the results that they've seen. I recommend that you look into it. Um, it's basically a new approach to test impact analysis. It uses a machine learning uh, model to uh, to build a predictive model to determine which tests should actually run. So if I've got twenty thousand tests that need to run, I can take a look at the history of those tests and the changes that were made and predict whether that test uh, is going to change its output, whether I'm going to get something interesting out of that uh, test. Is it going to go from successful to failure? Is it going to go from failure to successful? And if it's not likely to change, you just don't run the test, right? Now, this is, of course, recommended pre-merge, right? At some point in your SDLC, you should be running all tests. But this can really help for incremental changes uh, in the local uh, developer environment. And uh, it doesn't use deep learning to achieve this. Um, the, the model that was recommended in the white paper is a gradient boosted forest. So it can run just on a CPU. You don't need like a crazy GPU to make this work. Uh, and you can get really good results. Uh, so far, you know, a lot of folks who have implemented this are seeing over 99% accuracy, uh, which really helps again in those incremental changes. So, you know, effectively works by sending a code snapshot and, and, and uh, snapshot and test set into the predictive model. Uh, the ML model then selects which tests it thinks are actually worth running in this case. Uh, then those run and the test results are fed back into the model. So the model is also continuously training, uh, which is which is great. You don't have to have these expensive training uh, cycles. Uh, so getting near the end here, um, all of these acceleration technologies are great. Uh, we put them in place and um, uh, and things get faster, but they may not stay faster. Right, and a, a, a lot of the the philosophy of developer productivity engineering goes into this statement right here. You can observe a lot just by watching, right? So that's Yogi Berra, both catcher and philosopher. Uh, we can we can observe a lot about what's happening in the developer experience just by looking, just by looking at the data. But but we don't look at the data. Uh, but without focus, 
on this data, problems can creep right back in. Uh, so infrastructure changes, new annotation processors, like I mentioned before, uh, endpoint security settings, all of these things can, uh, can, can um, bring performance regressions right back into the system. So aside from the acceleration that we recommend in DPE, also, we need to have observation and analytics to make sure that our builds stay fast, as fast as they can possibly be, and that we're proactively avoiding things like failures and flaky tests. So, you know, for this, uh, we recommend failure analytics and uh, our trends and, and, and insights, because as Spotify put it, flaky tests are the pit of infinite sorrow. That is actually uh, in a Spotify article about flaky tests. They talk about this and they call them the pit of infinite sorrow. And that's because not only are they difficult to diagnose in many cases, and they lead to a lot of additional toil for our developers, um, but they can also have a direct impact on quality because when you're under the gun to crank out code, oh, the test failed. I better run it again. Oh, it succeeded this time. Great, done, pass it off. But there's probably a bug in there. Uh, so we really recommend um, you know, putting in a method for detecting flaky tests uh, and also for uh, looking at failures that are happening with organizations and uh, and seeing which ones could possibly be avoided. Um, this is an example of uh, I think uh, uh, this is a this is one of the test dashboards. This is actually a Spring framework. Spring uh, uh, the Spring project is using um, Gradle Enterprise to do flaky uh, flaky test detection as part of their DPE strategy. And uh, as you can see, what's happening here, we have a dashboard that just says you know on this one particular test, it was flaky one percent of the time over probably I think this is probably a week. Um, and so we should look at proactively dealing with that. Uh, our own Gradle build tool team, the open source Gradle build tool team, as well as our uh, Gradle enterprise uh, development team, they schedule flaky test days where once a month, they just look at this dashboard, they sort by test flakiness, and they investigate and eliminate uh, flaky tests and avoidable failures as well. Um, really important here that, that we, when builds are failing, that we can understand how many developers are impacted by the failure. Um, and... Uh, uh, and and how much time they're, they're wasting uh, waiting for this failure to occur that they'll then just have to run again. And then finally, you know, trends and insights. We've already kind of, sort of talked about this, uh, um, but we need to just get the data out there. You know, again, if you take a first step into the practice of developer productivity engineering, recommend that that first step being just gathering this data and making that data visible. You know, track your local build times, track the test cycle times, put them on a dashboard so that so that we can see what the developer experience actually is. So I would wrap up just by saying that we really believe DPE is going to become standard practice. I mean, again, it's it's already sort of permeated a lot of the um, the 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 early adopters, but it's it's moving pretty swiftly across the chasm to other businesses that are really concerned about developer productivity. Uh, but now is the time because the world really should foster developer joy. For all the boats that are being lifted in the harbor by software, we owe it to this workforce. We owe it to developers to make their experience as great as it can possibly be. Uh, more mature companies uh, will build focused centers of excellence for DPE. So Netflix and Spotify and LinkedIn, they all have um, uh, productivity engineers who serve a larger team of developers. Uh, okay, so just a few things to wrap up. First of all, if, 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 if I know that we're, we're like right at time, and so there's probably not going to be enough time to answer questions in this session, but I'll be kind of just moving right into the next session after this, and we can maybe answer some questions there too. But also come join us in our community Slack, uh, where you can ask questions after the fact. Um, we do have a summit coming up in November, the DPE Summit, uh, which is going to bring a lot of folks, some of these companies that I've, I've mentioned are going to be there talking about how they're thinking about developer productivity. So come join us in November, dpesummit.com. You can get all the details you need. We have a learning center at gradle.com. And we also have a book, uh, the Developer Productivity Engineering Handbook. Uh, it's free. Uh, you see Gradle on the front cover, and that's the only time you'll see our logo. It's a very vendorless and vendor agnostic uh, book just talking about the practice. So I recommend looking there. Um, and then, um, yeah, feel free to reach out. Uh, jreoc at gradle.com. I'm pretty easy to reach. I obviously love talking about this stuff and uh, hope to hear from you. So Richard, I know we're right up at time. I'm gonna turn it back over to you to, to close us out here.